thankfully we've got a little bit of a dry spell here. Okay, today we're going to be talking about uh, peaches, nectarines, and nectoplum, the hybrids. Uh, they all require the same treatment. Um, generally, this class of fruit, which is one of the top selling ones commercially in the U.S., is also known as the most sprayed crop, so it needs more pesticides than most. Um, it's difficult to grow peaches, nectarines without pesticides, and we'll talk about that too. So the um, main thing we have to watch out for on peaches and nectarines is a disease called peach leaf curl. Affects all three of the plants we're talking about, peach leaf curl, it's a fungus. If it rains more than five inches, six inches during the winter, you're more most likely to get it. I don't know if they have any cultivars, the peach and nectarines, that are resistant to this disease. Now, as far as the plant goes, it's not dangerous to the plant. The plant, it's, it's almost like having eczema or a bad skin problem, but it wastes the tree's energy. So what happens if we do get a lot of rain in the winter, uh, the new leaves it blooms, new leaves sprout out, they have red blotches, what look like blisters on them. They look real angry. I mean, the leaves look really angry. And then uh, as a tree grows in the spring, those leaves drop off and it puts on a new set of healthy leaves. And by summer, you say, well, the tree looks healthy, I don't have to treat it. Well, it's there and every spring it does the same thing, it puts out a set of leaves, they get those red blisters, they drop slowly, the tree places them. So the tree is wasting a lot of energy making a whole new set of leaves like that. So it, uh, your fruit quality is probably not quite as good. Um, so commercially, it's real important to take care of it because I'm sure this, the fruit is sweeter if you don't have to make a new set of leaves. Uh, a lot of homeowners don't treat it. I had neighbors that never treated theirs. They had the trees for a dozen years. They had good crops. They didn't care. So it, you know you don't have to do that one, but commercially... They always treat for peach curl, so it's a one of those things you have to do to keep your trees as healthy as you can. And the way we do that is with a product that has copper in it. Now, this one is called copper fungicide. In the past, we've had another one called liquid cop. Um, a lot of orchards use copper bordeaux. Uh, I don't think they can get lime sulfur anymore, which is another one that worked. Um, but there's only a few products that are of retail size. Like this product here is enough to treat probably a half dozen to a dozen full-size trees. You just attach your hose and go and you spray it this time of year when it's dormant. Now commercially what they do is they'll hit it when the leaves drop and they I've read that they hit it every five inches of rain they'll hit it again and again and again so if it rains 30 inches they're out there you know every few weeks hitting again just to make sure it doesn't get it uh, the disease can scar the fruit a little bit too which you know you don't see scarred fruit at the stores they don't allow it to be sold when it's got little blisters on the skin although homeowners you know when when you grow it you'll put up with a lot so so commercially they do this and um, they use a lot of sulfur products when they're doing it. So you, they say if you go to the Central Valley in January and February, it smells like sulfur. They're, they're, they're using a lot of the product. Now, they said the most effective spray is right when the flower buds are starting to turn color. Uh, now, we usually recommend hitting it once, you know, around after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, just to get one spray in. Because if it's raining, when the, they're starting to bloom, the sprays are not, you know, this doesn't work. So it's nice to get in one spray when it's dry. And if you want to try to hit it right when it's blooming, that's supposed to be the most effective time to spray it. Um, we've done, done this on fully leafed out plants. It doesn't seem to hurt them yet either. So the spray is not damaging to foliage or flowers. It just doesn't work. Once they've already finished blooming, you and you see the blisters up there and you spray it, it doesn't do anything. The damage is already done. So try to hit it sometime when it's dormant or at least right before it blooms. 
So peach leaf curl, um, most common disease we have affects anything that's a peach or nectarine. Um, the other thing that happens, and it didn't happen before 1990, so I grew peaches in the 1980s. We never saw worms in the fruit. And then right around 1990, we started getting worms. Um, apparently, they've already always been around, but we hadn't grown many peaches in Southern California until the 1980s. So all the, the pests that were common to peaches were in the Central Valley, but not down here. But once we started growing more peaches, um, what is called the oriental fruit moth, made an appearance. There's two close related insects, uh, peach, uh, I think it's called peach twig borer, and an oriental fruit moth. They do the same, almost the same thing. We know it's this one because of the style of damage we get, but both of them, what they do is during most of the year, the new growth coming out of the branches that's real green, the moths lay the eggs right on that new growth. The larvae, let's make a branch here with leaves on it. The larvae hatches out and drills a hole on the very succulent growth right down the middle of that stem, that new growth. So it cuts off the circulation, the, the leaves just shrivel up on the end and dry up and shrivel up and do that. And that's called flagging when you see that. The little new leaves are just hanging down brown. Now this doesn't do anything to the crop. In fact, it just makes the tree bushier. It, branch, it starts branching them here and here. Lost the tip, so it's like you just pinch the tip off and then it grows here and here and then that larva keeps doing it. The moth, there's like five generations a year and every so often they'll hit it again. You'll see more new leaves and the thing keeps branching like that. But the problem with these bugs is the middle generation in July goes into the fruit. So if you have a peach or nectarine that ripens anywhere in uh, summer, it's about, well, anywhere in summer, you'll get worms in it from that third generation. They'll drill right in there. The, this one's not, this one's easy to see because it goes right through the skin of the fruit into the fruit and you can say, okay, there's a worm in there, I can dig it out. This one goes into the fruit through the stem of the fruit. You don't know, it's really hard to tell it's there. Sometimes they can pick them off and you say, oh, I see that little tiny hole going inside the fruit. I know it's there, but most times you can't tell until you cut the fruit open and it's, and it's, uh, going, it's eating the flesh right around in the pit. So we know we have this one because it's always near the pit. So there's five generations here. The third generation goes into the fruit. We have a good control for that now. Back in the 80s and 90s, we just lived with it because we didn't have a non-chemical method or non a we didn't have any organic methods of controlling it. All you can do is cut your fruit open, eliminate the worm before you eat the thing. Um, but now we have a product called Spinosad chemical called spinosad, which is organic. And the product we carry most of the time, I mean, there's three or four brands on the market, but this is called Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew. Normally we carry the one that's least expensive for the homeowner. Cam Jack's Dead Bug Brew. Um, Spinosad is a chemical that was discovered in a rum distillery in the Caribbean Islands. So they kind of play up on the Pirates of the Caribbean theme here, Captain Jack's. Um, but it's something that people have already drinking, drunk, drank, so they consider it safe for human consumption. Apparently it's safe for all mammals and it kills uh, any, well, pretty much if you spray any insect with this, it'll kill it on contact, 
but generally once it dries it kills any chewing bug and any thrip. So chewing bugs like caterpillars, uh, beetles, green grasshoppers doesn't kill the brown ones, uh, chewing insects, and thrips are the two that it does a real good job on. Um, the first generation, now this is real interesting, these are real interesting bugs because they don't over, you know, most insects during the winter, they're either an adult hibernating, they're a pupa in a cocoon, or they're eggs. This one overwinters as a caterpillar. And uh, if you have an old peach tree, you'll notice that some of the ends, let me see if I have any on this one. We spray pretty good here, so I don't ex expect to see it. Well, on a branch on a peach tree, if you see the very end of a branch, it could be a short branch or a long branch, it's kind of swollen and gooey. That's called a hibernarium for this caterpillar. They, they hibernate at the end of a branch all winter long. So you can actually go through your tree and cut off all the tips. And you'll get rid of all the caterpillars in your yard. Now it won't stop the next generation if your neighbors aren't doing their tree. That's the problem we have, is if the neighbors aren't, aren't doing that, then you've got a treat for their caterpillars. The, their moths coming over and laying eggs on your tree since there's five generations a year. But this tree uh, seems pretty clean at the moment. And they say the first generation wakes up right when the tree's blooming and eats the flower petals. The first generation eats flower petals and then emerging new leaves. So if you spray it white when it's blooming, you'll control the first generation yard. And sometimes that's good enough. You won't see this bug the rest of the year unless, you're, again, your neighbors have the problem and they're not spraying. Yes? So if it's sticky as well? Is that yeah, and if on the tips of the stems, yeah, it's kind of gummy. Yeah, that's uh, the sign of that insect inside there. So, And you can watch your, you know, during the spring, you can watch your leaves, and if you see the flagging from the ends, spray it again. Uh, my yard, a lot of times, just spraying it once would do it, because I didn't have many neighbors who grew peach or nectarine trees. But uh, keep an eye on it to make sure. They don't seem to get into the fruit until the fruit's close to ripe. They don't seem to get in there till at least June. And there are peaches that ripen April and May and early June, and those never get the worms. For some reason, the early generations don't seem to like the fruit. It's, it's kind of weird that way. They only go in then that third generation. At least what I've seen. So. Okay, so that's the oriental fruit moth. And then the... Um, and these are insects, of course. And then the one other bug that's mainly a problem on uh, nectarines is the uh, flower thrips. I think it's the western flower thrip that gets in. But on nectarines especially, for peaches are, are protected, but the nectarines, they, don't, they have the smooth skin. And when they're blooming, the flower thrip goes into the flower and eats inside the flower. Or what, what thrips do is they're real tiny sliver-sized bugs, and they have, a, they call it a rasping type of, of um, damage. They slice little tiny slits in whatever they're at, whatever's tender, they, they slice it. Whatever oozes out, they sock it up. So they're slicing and dicing the stuff inside the flower. And apparently the nectarines, apparently the embryo inside there is more delicate or it's not covered with fuzz perhaps. So they slice up the skin of the nectarine as it, and as it develops, it's totally scarred. I mean, when I grew nectarines back in the 1990s, and we didn't have this uh, in the Camp Jacks, the same stuff, so spinosad. been oasted. But uh, we didn't have this, and the fruit looked like some kind of tumors you pulled out of a body. I mean, they looked horrible. 
the leaf damage, sometimes they had a, the fruit had a kind of a swoosh mark going across. That was the least damage you'd see, but usually it, it was crisscrossed and deformed and oozing. It didn't look like anything you wanted to eat. I looked at this stuff and said, boy, <laughs> you know, I don't want to eat this. Uh, I asked the grower, well, how organically can you control this insect? He said, well, you have to put this fine netting over your whole tree so they can't get fly through in there when they're blooming. Uh, of course, the bees can't get in there either, so what do you do? Um, so we, I, I pulled out the nectarine trees and just grew other trees instead. But then spindle sad came on the market, and that you spray that once on the flowers, and the, the thrips don't, don't come. I'll spray it weekly while they're blooming, and they won't come. As some of these trees bloom a long time. So that saves the fruit on the nectarines. And we just haven't seen the damage on peaches, which is kind of wild. It does uh, get the fruit of the uh, spicy nectar plum, too. So you have to spray this when they're blooming uh, at least once. Now, the other thing that we saw last summer, um, another disease, uh, mildew, powdery mildew. So we had a period of really humid weather, I think it was late summer, and the leaves were getting all white, uh, kind of a mold, on, the, especially on the new growth leaves were rolling up. So we had to hit the trees with an oil spray. Oils are considered organic products too. Neem oil works. This is just the mineral oil here. Uh, the neem oil cost about twice as much as mineral oil, so we use the mineral oil. Uh, it smells like, when you're spraying it, it smells like salad oil. The neem oil is, is uh, not as nice smelling, but it is an organic source. But any of the oils will control mildew pretty well. We also got hit last summer at the same time because of the heat. When we get hot, dry weather, uh, we tend to get spider mites. Peaches don't, and nectarines don't normally get it, but we got it this last year, so we hit it. The oil does that too. So oil does double duty, spider mites, and the uh, powdery mildew did a good job with that. Last summer, the almonds, which are close relatives of peaches and nectarines, they said in the Central Valley were just totally infected. <laughs> it was an explosion of spider mites in the Central Valley last summer. <clears throat> And that's pretty much it. Uh, there are other diseases, but we haven't, don't see them as often. Now, in the 1990s, uh, when the glass wing sharpshooter was at its worst, we had a nasty one in our backyard that was, what, would, what it would do is the sharpshooters um, are like mosquitoes of the plant world, and they would suck on the branches, introduce a bacterial infection, and the branch would die. And what was happening in my yard was the peaches and nectarines would bloom in the spring, nice bloom, uh, set a lot of fruit, and then slowly the whole branch would dry up and die, and I'd lose the crop. And then later that spring, they would grow a whole new set of branches that looked fine, with no fruit, of course. And then the next year, the tree would do that again. All They would bloom, set fruit, all those branches would dry up and die, grow a new set of branches. And for after three or four years, they go, well, this is crazy. What's going on here? Well, the uh, sharpshooter was spreading uh, what are called bacterial canker diseases. And bacterial cankers, when they suck on the branch, cuts off the circulation. So apparently they were hitting the, my trees and cutting off the circulation. It wasn't killing the tree because they don't suck on the big trunk, they just suck on the new growth, newer growth, and it just kept on killing the trees, so I pulled all those trees out, planted a new set in place of them, and the new set didn't get affected. What had happened was that uh, around 2000, they brought in the natural predator to the glasswing sharpshooter. 
So the population number of that sharpshoot dropped down to one-tenth of what it had been prior to that. So there wasn't as much infection going on. The, the sharpshooters are spreading oleander killing diseases. That's why there's not many oleanders here. Uh, they're still around. They're spreading diseases that kill uh, liquid ambers, purple leaf plums, olive branches. They don't kill the tree, but they kill all the branches off. So, so a lot of people just pull them out because they look terrible after that. Uh, they also spread diseases that go after grapes. So all of Temecula and the Southern California vineyards have to use pesticides to control that sharpshooter. But we don't seem to see too much damage on the peaches and nectarines at this point. Uh, probably not their favorite food. They'd rather go on something more green and succulent like grape plants. Now that bacterial canker, if you were treating it, you're supposed to, uh, whenever you prune off branches off of something like that, you're supposed to clean your pruners with bleach every time you, you cut off a branch, 10% uh, bleach solution on your, on your pruner. So, but fortunately we're not seeing too much of that one. So the, the problem with peaches, nectarines, most of these are vital. You got to do these treatments, whereas on other fruits, there's not much that we have to do every year. Fortunately, all of these things have a, um, an organic control now. All three of these items have the organic label on them use for use in organic orchards. Okay, so that's the bug control and disease control on them. Now, planting them is another thing, and training them. Uh, the nice thing about peaches and nectarines are not that particular about soil quality. So we don't tend to lose them if the soil is, doesn't drain well, it's not that as big a deal as it is with, uh, um, say, cherries and persimmons and avocados. They need good drainage. Peaches and nectarines seem to live in clay okay. Now, there is a thing that we did once. So the, the rootstock, we have several rootstocks that we grow on. One citation they brought out citation of, uh, about 20 years ago because it, it was very resistant to root rot and wet clay. So for a while, we were buying all our citrus with on the citation rootstock, which is a pink rootstock tag. This is Nemagard. I spell Nemagard. And then there's another one called Lovell. There's several rootstocks. These two, ha Nemagard handles sandy soils better. Lovell, dry soils better. Uh, Nemagard can handle dry soils pretty well too. We've kind of switched out from citation because what citation doesn't like, it doesn't like drought. So during the five years of drought we had, Almost every tree in my yard, I would say every tree in my yard on citation rootstock died when we turned the water back. But none of the trees on these other rootstocks died. And even in the containers at the nursery, it's kind of weird. Everything on citation rootstock loses its leaves in October. The stuff on Lovell and Nemagard doesn't lose their leaves till December. In my yard, the first year I planted citation, my trees defoliated in August. I thought they, they had all died, and I called up the grower and says, no, they just, you just need to water a little more. They just went to sleep early. So citation induces early dormancy, but it doesn't like the drought at all. So we kind of are backing away from citation. You know, Now watch what will happen is it will rain, 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 and everything will start rotting, but uh, uh, citation didn't handle the drought well, so we're kind of backing away from that. We think uh, that's more important than uh, root rot. Okay, so planting these, and the way you train them, that's the way you train them. So we've gone full circle on training. So the initial, original way that they trained peach trees, and originally when we got peach trees back in the 60s and 70s, 
they would be just one stick. It looked like a fishing pole. Sometimes they'd be a nice thick fishing pole. Commercially, they don't plant trees any bigger than this. This is called a 3 8 inch caliper. It's pencil thick. Uh, it's the lowest cost that's uh, reliable to plant. So the orchards tell the other orchards, you know, it doesn't make any sense to plant anything that's, say, this thick, which is considered uh, three, this is three quarter inch caliper, which costs two dollars perhaps more per well yeah about two dollars more per plant than this one but you see this one doesn't have any branching on it so the orchards need them to branch low to get production you know they don't want if they don't when we got this it was about this tall if you don't cut it the branches start here and they go up there and you can't reach any of the fruit so they always want this trees to branch out nice and low well, if you don't have any branches, what they do recommend is you cut it off at knee level to get them started. And the original way to prune peach trees was to cut them low and then train the branches to go like this. And the second year, train them to go like this. Third year, more like, more like this. Keep cutting them because they'll, they'll shoot up. And then you cut them again. For, keep forcing them to branch, 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 branch. And eventually you get 16 verticals going straight up. So you have a tree that's maybe 15 foot across, 16 vertical branches or, or stems, essentially 16 trunks. And then all the branches on the sides of these upright stems, you want them to be fairly horizontal because those fruit better. The stuff going straight up doesn't usually make flower buds because only the leaves at the very top can see the sun. So all the leaves going down the sides of these vertical branches don't make any flower buds. But all the branches that are fairly horizontal catch more sunlight along the branch, they make the flower buds. So they wanted 16 verticals. That means you cut them back, cut them back, and make them sprout out. But they said this took five or six years to develop the structure, during which time you're not getting much fruit. Um, and then they found out that the best peaches this tree makes, well, statistically, it doesn't make any sense for the orchard to keep their trees more than 13 years. Production apparently is best before their 10th year, and then by the 13th year, it's getting so lousy that you must have cut it down and start over. And they said, well, okay, this thing took too long to make, so let's do something simpler. So most orchards in California, instead of going to 16, they plant the trees closer together, you know, they can get trees like this, and they only go with two, three, or four. Instead of 16, they only go two, and then everything else is going to be more horizontal. So they plant more trees now, and fewer uprights. So you see a lot of orchards, you drive through Central Valley, you see a lot of them that have these V's or U's, this going straight down the row like that or four or you know when they do three looking from the top when they do three it's like this so all the trees look the same but they'll do four or they'll do two now in Canada they said that we've got such a short growing period they don't even want to do that they just want to stay with one one vertical and everything else more horizontal and we're telling homeowners do this because most of the trees we sell already have a nice branch structure decent one so no use cutting it no use cutting it real low to force branches because you know commercially they don't have a choice they buy trees like this they got to cut them low to get it to start branching but uh, when you get a tree like this, it's already there. And you can just go with the single trunk like they're doing in Canada and do it this way. So we're not, we used to cut our trees down at least three or four feet when we sold them. We go, uh, let's not do that anymore. Let's give the customer a choice which way they want to do it. So if you have a tree like with not any branches, you have to cut it short to, so it won't branch out too high. Just get it started. You can still grow it into one trunk. 
just train one straight up and everything else horizontal. But you got to initiate that branching low if you don't have. So if you know you, you sometimes we'll have a tree and it's missing some branches. Well, the only way you get your branches back in that position is to cut it down right to there, and you'll force the branch out, and then you'll have to train up one single trunk to go straight up again. But a lot of our trees do look like this. They've got a nice set of branches, uh, and you can just plant them as is. On this tree, the only thing I would do probably is get rid of this confusion right here. And get it down to a single branch like that. And this this one too. Try to make it a single rather than a cluster. Now the other thing that they found out is that on these horizontal branches, uh, now you know for homeowners the quality of your fruit, the size and all that's not that critical for most people. So if you just take a tree and keep pruning it to the size, like Dave Olson, they try to make it simple for homeowners. If you just trim the tree, I have to go back one step. So what happens on fruit trees is during the spring and summer, they're just growing. All they're doing is growing bigger and bigger and bigger all the way until fall starts. When suddenly the nights become longer than the days, then the trees stop growing. The leaves that get the most sunlight start making flower buds at that time. So all fall, they're making flower buds on whatever leaves you got left. So Dave Wilson says, oh, let's make it simple. Uh, for most homeowners, you can't reach anything higher than, say, seven foot. So cut your trees down to seven, keep them around seven foot all summer long. Do your final height control at, in the, at the end of summer, and that's it. Whatever you've left will make fruit for the next year. And that's all they say. The problem with that is that if you if you keep them growing in this spot in this dimension they can't really grow much because you keep cutting it off so the branches are getting shorter and shorter within this thing you're cutting it to this say seven foot by five foot area you're cutting it to and you keep cutting it the ends off the new growth is shorter and shorter and you get and what they found is that the sh if the branches are shorter than a foot the fruit is smaller in general so they found that the best fruit are in the branches that grew between a foot about this long and two foot about that long. Those make your best fruit. Branches that are about like this make the best quality fruit. The branches that are too short, like this one, fruit quality is going to not be as what they want for a commercial. So what they're saying to do is go through the winter and you want to have a good a branch of the proper length about every foot or so on each side of the tree. Well, it depends how many sides you want. You can have four sides. You can say that my tree divided my tree into four sides or six sides. Let's say let's divide this tree into four sides. So let's say if you have this branch here, then you have this branch here, and then this branch here are almost lined up. Well, this, these two, three are, this one's probably too close. Even if you go a foot apart. So let's say it start with this one. We'll cut this one short so it doesn't fruit. Uh, that one we might save. Save that one. This one's kind of, you can say it's pointing toward the back, but it's kind of thick. I don't see many flower buds on it, so I'm going to cut it short too. And I'm going to cut it to the bud facing this way, a different direction. So hopefully the new growth will come out and fill this gap on this side. This one you kind of cut short. So what happens this coming year, this branch will fruit, branch will fruit, but it also will grow longer than you want it to. So the next winter, you hope this branch is coming right here where you want it. This branch, you cut it short and make it start over. This one too, this one will fruit. It'll grow bigger, branch out. Hopefully you'll have another branch, and we'll cut this one short, say. And hopefully this branch will come in and fill that gap, and then cut this one short, and let it regrow the next year without fruiting. And this one will hopefully fill that area. You'll have a branch here, a branch here, and those will be fruiting for you. 
So you're trading locations on your trunk to make that same branch in the same spot over and over just by cutting off, cutting the ones off. This side, you got this branch, this branch, they're a good distance apart, won't touch them. Then you have this one, that's not bad. On this side, too many branches, you got this one. Maybe we'll cut this one short, this one, cut this one short, and you have this one. This side, this one might be a problem. Uh, let's cut that one short. That's not too bad distance wise. This top split into two. And there's no rules here. We can you don't have to just have one trunk all the way up. You can work with this one as the main trunk and then maybe just cut this one. Well, this one's already well let's cut this one short next year and use this as a, as a trunk. I can leave that alone for the time being. So something like that. So hopefully you can keep this tree just, you know, that'll be about what, about four foot wide and maybe seven foot tall. Um, once this tree's mature, it can probably produce 60, 70 fruit on, a, on something four foot wide and seven foot tall. And that's probably all you want because most peaches ripen in two weeks on one tree. It ripens all its crop in two weeks. If you let a tree grow, you know, 15 foot wide, it's like 400 fruit. You got two weeks to eat it. <laughs> so this way, this is this is good news for the homeowner because now you can every four feet or five, you can give them a little room. Five feet, you plant a different peach tree. There's peaches that ripen in April. There's peaches that ripen in May, June, July, and to August. So you can pick which, you know, pick a different tree. Put them real close together, and you can have 50 those two weeks and 50 the next two weeks. You can keep doing that. Now, on peaches, nectarines, both, the best quality fruit ripens in summer. If it ripens in spring and we're in June gloom or May gloom, flavor's not quite as good. It's still not bad. We've had quite a few early peaches that are pretty darn good. You know, as good as stuff in the store. But if you want the best peaches, those are the ones that ripen July into August. And when it's hot and sunny, they reach peak quality and peak size. So you have options of how you can train these trees. So, um, you know, we're recommending, a, they call this the spindle shape. You can say it's kind of like a Christmas tree. So that the bottom branches are longer, they'll get the sunlight, the top branch is shorter so they won't shade out the bottom too much. In theory, the perfect shape for a fruit tree is a dome. In the most uh, surface area, but it's hard on a lot of these trees to create that especially if you only have one trunk going up the middle. So uh, we go with the spindle shape instead. That's the best you can do with one trunk. And apple orchards are commonly done this way now. And they get more fruit per acre than they used to do with this. So you need more trees, but you're actually getting more fruit per square foot with this shape. More pruning to keep it that size, but uh, more rewarding too. Now. Peaches and nectarines, again, uh, with all the pruning we do on them, they don't respond well to pruning wounds, so uh, that's why it's 13 years is about what a commercial orchard does, because you start wiping, you know, it just starts killing the tree by all that pruning. Um, so what do you do? You know, if you don't prune at all, the tree will live longer, your fruit quality will suffer. So. Okay. So what is the happy medium between pruning and tree life for a homeowner? Are you looking at a 20-year-old tree? Or? Well, let's just say that fruit quality is not our most important issue because they're still really good. They just are not as big and is not as nice. 
So 25 years is kind of common on peaches. Uh, usually after 25 years, the trunk just falls apart anyway. <laughs> you know, the, what happens on peach trees is all, there's so much dead wood on them, the termites just cl clean out the middle of the tree and you've got a shell left. Uh, but all the stone fruits do that. They all get termite ridden or bore ridden and then they just fall over one day and they're hollow and you go, oh, you blame the termites, but it wasn't, the termites don't eat living tissue, so it's not the termites' fault, it's just that all the pruning we do on them kills them and the termites clean it up. So, yeah, don't blame termites, they actually, uh, the U.S. Forest Department determined that termites allow trees to live to their longest potential because they, they keep the dead wood cleaned out. So. Otherwise, fungus would get in and wipe the whole tree up. Okay, so that's training. Any questions on training? I'm sure I left something out. Oh, fertilizing. So when we plant peach trees, and when you plant a bare root, and when they plant orchards, the way they do it, they said they have two guys digging a hole, one guy puts the tree in, and one guy puts the dirt back in the hole, takes them 20 seconds to do each tree. Um, or they plant another new tree every 20 seconds, they said. And they have to, of course, they're doing thousands. But they do not put anything in the hole. They just use the native soil, put the tree in, try to bury it, and try to get all the roots buried. The soil level is not critical as long as the roots aren't showing and you don't cover the graft union up where they have the little dog leg there where the graft is this is the graft as long as you don't cover that you're fine the graft is usually about three inches above the roots but if you you know as long as you don't cover it it's, it doesn't seem to hurt the tree bad at all so no compost in the ground you can put compost and mulch on top of the ground but no compost in it it hurts the roots now, oh, one other thing, um, there is a, something called a replant syndrome. We talk about it all the time, but if you pull out a stone fruit and put another one in, the new one going in won't grow. It doesn't like, so whenever, if you had an old, even an old apricot tree in the ground and it died from old age, well, generally if that tree was in good condition, there was roots every quarter inch running through the soil. You can pull the tree out, pull out all the big roots. You still have lots of little tiny roots that are now rotting in the soil. You put a baby tree in there, like this big, it's, easy, it's just surrounded by pieces of dead ancestors. It's just equivalent to your house full of pieces of your grandparents lay, laying in the carpeting. There's no way you can be healthy and, and thrive in that. So you've got to get rid of that stuff. Now... What the U.S. Department of, well, it's, it's actually U, uh, University of California, Davis, they figured out if you just replace, for an orchard, replace the soil three foot wide and one and a half foot deep with soil from an area that doesn't have those roots in it, they'll do fine. That's for a full-size tree. Now, we don't need to go full-size. I would tell you just do two foot wide by one foot deep. That's plenty of soil. That's... Uh, Two by two uh, is four cubic foot. That's more than the soil in a 24 inch box. You grow a big tree in a 24 inch box. That's all the dirt, all the new dirt you need to put in that dirt. In our top pot, either as a potting soil in a pot or as a cell substitute is fine. Sand is fine. Again, dirt from a distant part of your yard that doesn't, hasn't grown a, a, a stone fruit is better but these work fine. Don't use, uh, most potting soils will kill these trees. Do not use, quote, ordinary potting soils. Potting soils in general are made from ground up trees. It's like, uh, trees do not like to grow in dead bodies of trees. We don't have ground up trees in our potting soil. So, okay, so that's the replant syndrome. It's interesting because when they did the research, they found that the trees actually do better in an old orchard when they replace the dirt than we put them in a brand new farm. Because they do like to have their buddies around them, apparently. They, the roots connect together and they help each other out. 
Whereas if you put them in a brand new farm with nothing established, they grow slower. But you put a, a new tree in an old orchard with new soil, it grows to its fastest potential. So that, I thought that was pretty interesting. One other thing. Um, we never used to think about sun burning on, on peaches and nectarines here because it's never been hot enough, but this last summer, 115 degrees, that just burns at trunks. So on the peach tree, the most and nectarines, the most vulnerable part of the tree to sun is right here. Because the rest of it is fairly straight, and these are too skinny to catch the light. So this is the fat part, and if the sun, if the sun hits this flush right here, it can burn it, and, and then borers get in there. So what you're supposed to do is turn the tree so that the graft, the little dog leg from the graft faces south, so the sun can't hit it. I never used to tell people that, but now, you know, when we had the 115 degrees, what can you do? <laughs> you got to do it, or you paint this white are covered with cardboard so the sun can burn it. So, so if you want to be perfect, face the graft toward the south. Okay, I think I cover everything about planting now. I saw, I saw a new orchard in the valley. It looked, it looked to me like the plant there planted all at an angle. Have you ever heard of that? Well, they might have been espalying those trees. Yeah. It looks like maybe I was maybe it's not the collusion or something. It looks to me like they were all planted uniformly. Well, they do a lot of apple orchards where they plant the trees like this, and then they grow the branches this way. Oh. So it's actually crisscrossed. It looks like it was the other way to me. Hmm. Like it was like that was south. Don't know. Interesting. Uh, yeah, there's no set rules here. I mean, I'll, you know, I was going to mention sometimes we'll get a a bare root tree in that splits in the two, and each one has a nice set of branches on it. It's like, okay, if I cut this one off, half the tree is bare, and if I cut that one off, the other half is bare. There's no rule that says you can't have the two trunks. They just don't produce any fruit, but you still have the nice branch, and you can keep that. That's it's not that big a deal. You can break the rules. You know, farms, they don't like, they have to make the rules real simple for their employees. So they just go with one. But uh, if you had a tree that came like this, I'd keep both branches. Yes? You mentioned earlier about the bark. And, uh, four different varieties. And the red bearing, the bark is getting very callous and splitting open. Is that inhibiting the nutrient flow? Hmm. Well, if, you, if it's yeah, if it's splitting real deep, I don't know. They they heal pretty fast though. I don't know. You just look at your crop and see how it how it goes. But yeah, whenever the bark splits, you worry about it because that's where borers can get in. But sunburning will do that. So if you get a sunburn on on the side of a, uh, a side of a stem, it kills all the tissue here, say for an inch wide. And then that, so that's dead. So in order for the tree to continue growing, the bark from both sides that are healthy uh, kind of splits, kind of just grows over there, splitting the bark as it does that. So everything here splits off, the, the surface splits off, and then the bark underneath, or the growth underneath kind of closes into there and covers it up again. And then it's, and it's sealed again. So, but sunburning, yeah, we see a lot of sunburning on a lot of trees this year, and that they're all dead on one side, and the, so that bark cracks, and then the new growth comes over and covers it. <clears throat> okay, so varieties. <clears throat> we'll go peaches first. And we'll go by order. Um, So there's Eva's Pride, and uh, 
we don't have this one at the moment. We carried it last year, and I, I couldn't get any confirmed early this year, so I didn't get any on my first shipment. But my supplier's list had Tropic Snow on their next shipment, so we got it ordered now. And there's another one called Long Beach. These are all fairly early peaches. Low chill. Um, so the University of California did a study on peaches at, in Irvine to see um, which trees were the best to plant, peaches. And they determined, well, that the best quality peaches had the highest chill, produced the least amount of fruit, and the lowest quality peaches made the most fruit. <laughs> and the reason for that is most of the low chill peaches, the peaches that don't need much winter, wake up early, ripen early. So when they, and then when they ripen and the weather's cool, then uh, the quality isn't there. Just trying to get the exact dates for you. So the um, Eva's Pride So Long Beach we've had in the past. I have a I might have one or two left. The supplier who supplied us with Long Beach has gone out of business. But this one ripens usually in May for us. Eva's Pride is usually June. However, all these trees have about a month period in which they can produce. Because I've seen Eva's Pride produce in May before. Um, when it was still raining. <laughs> One year when we had, uh, I guess, an early winter and it leafed out early and the fruit ripened early. The book says June, but I've seen Eva's Pride in May. Tropic Snow is June. Uh, this is, Tropic Snow is a white peach. These two are yellow. So those three uh, should never fail to produce fruit for us because their chill is really low. In fact, they've, you know, as far as we know, they've never failed here. Their chill factors are down probably 200 hours or less, which we usually seem to get. I mean, one year the University of California claimed we only had 80 hours, you know, and sometimes they don't listen to them because all these still made fruit we know was closer to 200, so. There's a lot of ways to measure chill and they're, the method they used isn't, uh, I don't think it's as accurate. So we don't have Long Beach and Beirut this year. We do have Eva's Pride and we should get Tropic Snow. Uh, those are the earliest peaches. Then we have um, Mid Pride. Peachy Keen. Uh, Mid Pride is late June, early July, as far as I remember. It actually says July. Peachy Keen is, so these are both mid July. And they're both yellow meat. Um, the chill on mid pride, I'm not, I haven't grown that enough. I don't think that misses too often. Yeah, 250, that's pretty low. So that might have missed one year. I dropped that top. It's way back against the black. <laughs> okay. Okay. Excuse me a second. So that would have missed one year. We think Peachy Keen is close. We think it's around 270. Uh, when Peachy Keen came out two years ago, the 
grower thought it was 150, but we don't think it's that low. We think it's because it, this one was found near Pismo Beach, and those people think that you don't get chill below. You only get chill below 44, but we know you get chill below 55. So Pismo Beach, really cool when you talk about 55 degrees. So we think the chill on Peachy Keen is around 270, mid prides around 250. Um, the one thing that a grower noted about Peachy Keen, really heavy production early. Uh, we'll see how, you know, it's so new, we don't have a good handle yet on how good a taste it is and how good it produces here. But the grower said on their, on their first crop of trees that were less than two years old, they're averaging 100 fruit per tree at <laughs> less than two years old. So uh, really heavy production on this. So we hope this one's going to become one of our major peaches. We hope it's good enough that it'll become one of our major peaches that we sell. And we're happy that Dave Wilson picked up because Allie Cook, which discovered it, our first propagated, went out of business. But uh, Dave Wilson apparently liked it too. So we're, we're getting the, we have the peachy keen. And then there's August Pride and Red Baron. Um, August Pride is actually late July to early August. And Red Baron's the same, they're both the same. Some years August Pride would fruit before Red Baron, some other years Red Baron would fruit right before August Pride. Uh, we think the chill makes a difference. So August Pride seems to be about 250, Red Baron about 300. So Red Baron missed, for most people, Red Baron missed four of the last five years, didn't fruit well at all. August Pride didn't miss. Even on the years we got really bad chill, it seemed to still f wake up and fruit fairly normally. So most of the people who are, who've watched the trees at the field station have said August Pride is the best peach we can grow here. Red Baron, I would tell you, slightly better quality than August Pride, but they're both really good peaches. So we push the August Pride more because it's never missed. Um, we think the weather's going to be cooler in the winter. I mean, this year, definitely a lot cooler winter. Um, you know, no 80 degree days since mid November. Just nothing. Like the last five years, you get 90 degrees in December, 90 degrees in January. It just hasn't, I don't think it's going to happen. So, uh, Red Baron is probably going to do well again. Now, Red Baron, the main thing about this tree is when it blooms. I mean, the flowers look like red carnations. And we've seen this tree bloom for six weeks nonstop. Just crazy. When we first saw Red Baron, we said, this thing can't be a fruit tree. It's too pretty. Even August Pride has pretty, leaf, pretty flowers, but Red Baron, just crazy. It looks like one giant red carnation in the yard, and people are just amazed by what it looked like. And then the, when we got the fruit back in the 90s on it, we said, yeah, you can't beat that. He's got a photo of this tree. So, uh, yeah, when it blooms, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. I mean, the flowers seem to last two weeks each flower. It's just crazy what that tree does. Yeah. This year it should. So, so Red Baron, when it's on, it's, it's as good as you can eat. Um, now, there's a couple of weird trees we have. Um, totally different peaches. One's, one's Donut, and there's another one called Sazi Swirl. Now, what's interesting is Donut is the Donut peach, which is a bagel-shaped peach, shaped like this, about that big. We call it donut because the seed is like this, 
So most people, what they do when they eat it is they just push the seed right through the center and then you have a donut ring of flesh, but it looks like a bagel. It's a white flesh peach that ripens in July. It's white, but it apparently is the ancestor to most of these low chill peaches. Uh, now, it in itself, we think the chill on donuts is around 300, so it's not super low, and it often doesn't produce that well, but it seems to produce every year no matter what. Uh, but a lot of people love the donut peach. Now, Sazi Swirl is totally new. It's got its white flesh with a little bit of red marbling, so they call it a swirl. And they think the chill on that one is really low. In their catalog, it says 400 hours. The sales rep told me they think it's around 200 hours. Just because it blooms really early along with the really early peaches. So, but we don't know yet. This will be our first winter with the tree. We had some trees last year. We'll see how they bloom this coming spring. If they're early, then we'll know this is early. The only thing bad about Swazi Swirl, it also ripens early. So it ripens, I believe, in June, which might be a little bit too early to get peak quality. I've never had a bad. I've never had a bad Long Beach though. Now Eva's Pride. Yeah, I remember eating it in the rain one year, but apparently it had sunlight before that. It was pretty good even in the rain. And then some years a little bit not as sharp a flavor. Still sweet, but not as sharp a flavor. Yeah. Yeah, I have a feeling that Red Baron will produce well for the next 10 years by what we've been told by some of the climatologists about our climate getting cooler now. Um, well, it'll, it'll shorten its lifespan if you cut it down real good a week ago. <laughs> so, I think that's our entire lineup. Let me just show about my... I think that's all the peaches we have. There's a few others that are supposed to do well here. June Pride, but uh, we don't see a reason for it. And there's a lot of peaches with low chill that you find at other stores. Uh, uh, Florida Prince, um, Early Amber. There's quite a few from Florida and, and Arizona, but Florida and Arizona don't have June and May gloom. So there are peaches still to come out good when they were that early, but around here, not so good. So they produce real well. I think the university study showed that Florida Prince was the best producing peach in, in this area, but the poorest quality. So. Of course, there's always be a year when we have sunny springs and they're fine. So, okay, nectarines. Very few nectarines do well here. Very few. So you have to pick and choose the right ones. Um, Desert Delight. This one, you know, I haven't grown, I grew this one back in the 90s when we had those strips, but I don't remember it that well when it ripened. But I know it's early. So the, it says June, and it is a uh, yellow meat nectarine. And then there's another one that I grew back in the 90s called Double Delight. And it is July. So much better time 
and it is also yellow meat. D double light is 300 hours, so most things that needed 300 hours wouldn't have produced the last five years, and, and that's the problem. Double light is a pink flower. It's kind of like the, a pink version of Red Baron. <laughs> So it's got a real good flower also, and it blooms, uh, we think, as good as Red Baron, but it's a nectarine. And it needs about the same amount of chill on it, too, about 300 hours of chill. Desert Delight has never failed. Let me get the chill on that one. I don't know the exact hours. It's just that Desert Delight ripens early. The book says 100 to 200, so no problem. It would never fail here. Uh, the other one we carry is Snow Queen, which is a white nectarine. Snow Queen used to be our top seller until we ran into the five years of uh, <laughs> no chill. So Snow Queen hasn't done a whole lot in the last five years. It is a white meat. It ripens in late June. So we haven't pushed Snow Queen lately just because of the, in fact, double light, same thing. We tell people, oh, it's the best. This is the best nectarine quality-wise we can grow but it needs 300 hours. Snow Queen is the best white nectarine we can grow, but it needs 300 hours. There's another one that we didn't, we're not carrying as much. We didn't carry it this year, it's Arctic Star. It's another white nectarine. It's mid-June, just a little bit earlier than Snow Queen. So. Snow Queen we promote because it's late June. You're more likely to get sun late June than early June. And it's also 300 hours. But I've had a lot of customers from inland Orange County. So Fullerton inland area where the June gloom's not so bad say this is incredibly good where they live. But still, 300 hours. It wouldn't have produced much in the last four or five years. Some people will go gold mine, but that needs 350 hours. Now, if you live in canyons in Orange County, any canyon, Laguna Canyon, Tribuco Canyon, you, you get the cold. You get, I know one of our customers in Tribuco Canyon in late November told me that they already hit 20 degrees. <laughs> It's hard to believe, you know, it's just a few miles north of where I used to live, 20 degrees in one of those canyons up there. So they get a lot of chills, so they can grow stuff like this. Um, okay, so that's the nectarines that we carry. Panamint, I'll mention. It's July, it's yellow meat, and it might be slightly below 300, might, you know, I'll have to say 300 though. Panamint, we used to sell a lot of, but the quality isn't very good. So I remember in the 1990s, my Panamint made lots of fruit, I rarely ever picked them. They're okay. They're not bad tasting, but they're not they're not nearly as good as anything else up here. So we just don't push it. A lot of people still request it because uh, you know I guess we used to push it, but uh, it's just not as good a flavor. Even the birds didn't eat them at my house. It was crazy. They just left them on the tree. Okay, so the other one. If you like nectarines, then the Nectar Plum may be the better than the nectarine. So Nectar Plum, there's only one. It's a cross between nectarine and plum, 
but in essence, it's just a white nectarine with plum colored leaves. That's what it turns out to be. So, spice Z, um, the chill on it, we think it's around 270. So, it made some crops in the last five years. It does ripen in July, mid July. It is a white flush. And it is very ornamental. I mean, the flowers on it, mauve pink, big flowers, singles, but big. And then the new growth is kind of a burgundy red. And then matures to a deep purple red. The foliage does turn to bronze and kind of greenish by late, mid to late summer. So it loses that real neat color. But all spring long, it's, it's a gorgeous tree, just like the purple leaf plum color. The fruit are, the skin of the fruit are beet red, and the flesh is white. It does get all the same things the nectarines get, the thrips, the worms in them, so you do have to treat it for that. But because the chill is lower than the top quality nectarines, uh, it is exceptional that way. So it's the best quality quote nectarine that we can probably grow here more reliably. Any questions? I don't think I left much out. Um, got a, um, a batch of Arctic Rose nectarines in by mistake. Had our name on it, but it wasn't on our invoice. If anybody wants to try one, <laughs> Arctic Rose is supposed to need 400 hours of chill, though. So unless you live in a canyon someplace, there's not much hope. But it's supposed to be really good. I think that's it. All right. Thank you very much. So you said you don't have the Long Beach? Uh, Dave Wilson didn't pick it up, so I'm, and I think I'm, I think I'm totally out. So it was a good peach, but I don't know if it's much.